Wow. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I tell you what, to think about our God and what he can do for us and has been doing for us and in us, and uh, it's exciting. I hope everybody had a good Christmas and that you got everything that you wanted. <laughs> and not everybody's laughing or making any comments there. Well, I have come this morning, and first of all, I do want to say that I appreciate so much, Judith and I both, uh, the privilege that we have of being a part of you. You are some of the most wonderful people that we have ever met in our entire lives, and we love you dearly. And uh, thank you so much for receiving us so graciously as you have. And, uh, and I'm thankful for our pastor and for the pastor's family. They are definitely people of God. And uh, you feel and sense their care and their concern. And it is, uh, it is wonderful. Uh, uh, pastor said for me to be sure and to announce that next Sunday there will be water baptism and uh, also opportunity for membership if you would like to be a part of that. Uh, you can see pastor or one of the pastoral staff, and they will definitely help you to know what needs to be done. Sister Pat's right here, so she can help you, I'm sure. All right. I, uh, this is a season of great joy, uh, a time of great celebration, and I, I'm sure that you have uh, experienced that. We've also seen the different individuals that have also had some sadness to go along with their gladness, but we're thankful to the Lord because the God has some way of turning everything around for our good, and so that there's never a time that really we cannot thank him and praise him for all that he does for us. My message to you this morning that I feel that the Lord has laid on my heart, it's one that I have preached just recently, I will let you know that whenever I went to the Heron Church of God, but I really am so excited about this message that I have wanted to share this uh, with whomever that I had the opportunity to do so, and I felt the liberty to do that by the Spirit today. And uh, I've entitled the message, How to Live in a Continual State of Joy. How would you like to be able to do that, to live in a continual state of joy? If you would, just raise your hand. Let me see your hands. Now, some of you didn't. You're just deadheads. That's all that's matter with you. No, I don't mean that. Anyway, but uh, I know some people just don't like to raise their hand when you ask questions like that. But anyway, uh, we, we know that, how many of you enjoy a good joke? Does it make you, you know, laugh, get excited and all that kind of stuff? Well, I decided that one of the things that I would do for the joy was to tell a little joke today, and you can tell me afterwards or I'll probably know whether it was good or not. <laughs> but it's entitled to three wise women rather than the three wise men. And they said, have you ever thought about what it would have been like that if there had been three wise women rather than three wise men? They said, first of all, they would have asked directions on the trip, and they would have gotten there on time. The second thing is, is they'd help deliver the baby. The second thing is they'd have cleaned the stable, they'd have brought a casserole, and also brought disposable diapers. Okay? So anyway, I'll let you, there was a few, okay, that's good, that's good. I'll take that. <clears throat> but in, in your Bible, if you would like to turn with me to uh, John chapter 17 and uh, verse 13, uh, this uh, particular chapter is known as actually the Lord's Prayer. I know that we refer to the Lord's Prayer as the one that we find in uh, the book of Matthew and also in the book of Luke. But in reality, this is the actual prayer that Jesus prayed for his disciples. And uh, there was one particular thing that he prayed for, which is where I'm going to be using my text for this morning, and that is, he's prayed in uh, verse 13, he says, But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy 
fulfilled in themselves. So it is Jesus' will that you and I would have, now catch this, not your joy, but his joy fulfilled in you. It's a big difference because, you know, our joy is, uh, is temperamental. It can be going up and down. We c it can change with the wind, so to speak. But we can see that whenever we have the joy of the Lord in us, uh, there's so many benefits from this. Uh, you know, the scripture that we mentioned in Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is what? My strength. Uh, so if you're really wanting to have strength, you have to maintain the joy of the Lord alive in you. Now, if you're a born-again believer this morning, I want you to know you already have the fullness of His joy in you. You've got it right now. I'll ask you this. Has Jesus ever prayed a prayer that wasn't answered? I rest my case. If He prayed for you and for me as He prayed for those disciples, the fullness of His joy is already inside of us. Now, there's some other things that brings us joy in the world. Uh, uh, the, one of the scriptures that I like to uh, think about whenever I'm talking about things like this is found in Proverbs 17 and 22. It says, A merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. <laughs> My wife loves this one particular commercial on television. <laughs> and she says, play it again. We've got DVR. And I played that thing over and over and over again the other night, and she was literally rolling in the seat. She just could not be still. She, had, she said, stop, stop! <laughs> because it, it, it just made her so much laughter. And, and it's like a medicine to us, isn't it? It just it makes us feel good on the inside, but it says a broken spirit dries the bones. It means it literally dries up the structure of your being. Now think about that. The bone structure is the structure of your life and my life, and it can literally be dried up. Another thing that usually brings joy into our lives is the birth of a child. Uh, Sister Judith and I are now grandparents all over again. Our little Blakely Lynn is one month and three weeks old. And the, the Lord willing, we're going to go see her today if Mama and Daddy will allow us to come. But uh, anyway, there's nothing in this world. I've got pictures on my phone and all of this, and every now and then I'll pick it up, you know, and I'll look at it and review and look at the picture of her, and she's just a doll. She looks like a grandfather. That's why it is. <laughs> but anyway, and another thing, uh, Bree, I thought about you whenever I was thinking about this is that uh, when a student passes their midterm exams, it brings a lot of joy, doesn't it? <laughs> and a lot of relief because I remember whenever I would have those exams and uh, you'd be sweating it and somebody would ask you after the exam was over, well, do you remember this or that? No, I don't remember that. I'd cram for the exam is basically what, what I did. But anyway, and, and then we can see if a person finds a job and especially at a time like this, what we're living in now, if a person finds a job, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really a, a great thing. And if you've been out of work for a long time, I know that that can be uh, real stressful to you. When a couple gets engaged to be married, uh, I've sh shared with you that uh, I met Judith almost over 20 years ago, and uh, I fell in love with her and asked, me to, asked her to marry after I'd only known her for 10 days, or 11 days. 11 days. And I told you, that was another sermon for another day. But nonetheless, but, uh, you know, uh, our kids thought we had lost our minds. Uh, but nonetheless, it's lasted, and it's been good. But anyway, uh, and, and, you know, and the greatest joy, I think, of all is when somebody comes to know Jesus as their personal Savior. Would you agree with me in that? Uh, and, and just a few Sundays ago, I got a text from one of the uh, ladies that we had pastored in uh, in the Harlan Road Church. She's not going to the church there anymore, but nonetheless, she was, uh, she was texting me and, and letting me know that her husband, who had, we had prayed for and believed for for quite some time, that he would come to know Jesus as a personal Savior. And she said, th these are her own words. She says, Pastor, she says, I'm, I'm so thankful, beyond thankful, 
She says, God has answered our prayer and really wanted to share the good news with you. Because there's nothing in this world to see two uh, companions that they will come together in the Lord in that, in that manner. Uh, a scriptural thing kind of gives us a little bit of background to this as well or gives us a little bit more insight in Luke chapter 15 and 6 when it says, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. And, and God loves the world, does He not? He loves everybody that's in here today. Now you know it's the devil's job to make you feel like that you are not worth anything. And that God doesn't care a thing about you. But i got good news to tell you today. God loves you, what the scripture says, with an everlasting love. There's never a time that he doesn't love you. Give him a praise offering from that or something and say, yes, thank you, Lord. Never a time. <clears throat> uh, you know, but there's sometimes with the challenges and the struggles that you and I want and that we go through with, it's easy for us to forget that. I mean, uh, if you think about the children of Israel, they had just experienced one of the greatest deliverances in their entire life when they were delivered from Egypt. And three days after that they were in the wilderness, they were belly aching and complaining because they didn't have any water like God would not uh, provide that. And they were getting ready to kill the pastor. <laughs> Moses, uh, Moses was their pastor. But nonetheless, you know, God delivered them again and again. So we're easy to forget the times that God has blessed us. We forget the scripture where it says in Psalm 118 and 24, This is the day that the Lord hath made, and I will rejoice and I will be glad in it. Amen. Amen. If you ever woke up on the wrong side of the bed and somebody will say, Praise the Lord. you say, Would you be quiet? Anybody ever done? I remember one time there was this individual I was with. I was driving down uh, the freeway in Long Island, New York, and it's known as the longest parking lot in the world because they have so many times that they stop. The air conditioner went out in the car, and I started singing, This is the day. This is, they looked at me and said, Would you shut up? <laughs> the sweat was pouring down their face and everything, you know, and I'm singing, This is the day that the Lord hath made. All right. And you know, and I can still remember whenever I was pastoring, uh, I would come to church, and, and I, uh, Sister Judith and I, we took our pastor very seriously. And uh, whenever people would come to church, and I'd see them, and I'd look at the faces, and I would see that there was no joy. The, the songs we would be singing, and, th and it was just like there was deadness that was inside of, of them. And, and they, were, they were great people. They were good people. They were faithful people. They were sweet people. But somewhere along the line, they lost their joy. And, and I want you, and whenever I say lost their joy, now let me qualify that. They already have the joy in them. But the devil is a master at distractions. And he tries to get us looking over here and looking over there and over here and seeing all of the rough places that we have to go through within this life. But I want us to understand that the joy of the Lord has never left us. Because he prayed, I want the fullness of my joy, Father, to be in them. I mean, you've got it boom, 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 bubbling inside of you right now. Amen. Well, I'm having a good time. What about you? All right. So then whenever we go back to the text and it says, And Father, I pray that they may have the full measure. Think about that. The full measure of my joy within, within them. That means it goes all the way up to the top and literally it's so flowing, he says, it just flows over. Remember in John 7 and and verses 37 and 38, when he talks about the infilling of the Holy Spirit, he says there's like a, a well of living water that's bubbling up inside of us. Do you know what I'm saying when I, when I say that? Uh, I, whenever I see you come to the altars and see you worship, and I see the expressions of joy that's upon your, your face, I know that many of you are going through hard and difficult times 
But God is giving you a fresh touch, a, a new experience with that joy that is already inside of you. And it's wonderful to behold. It's wonderful to see. Now, in John chapter 15 and verse 10 and 11, it says this. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Now, he's not talking about the commandments that are, are the, the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees. Did you know that they had 613 different laws? And that's what you had to, if you messed up on any of those, you was out. You were, you, you were not accepted. But we know that the two main commandments that the Lord looks at, he says that, and you know, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your might, with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of, uh, all of your being. And he says, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two commandments that everything else is, is hinged upon them. And he says, if we keep the commandments, and that means that we keep it fresh. Uh, if, if, you, uh, if you're alive, there are times that you mess up. I don't care who you are. You're going to mess up. But what he is talking about is if you mess up, you make it right. That where you get into problems is you don't make it right. If you make it right, you're going to maintain the completeness and the full of his joy in your life. J.B. Phillips' translation says it this way. He says, Father, that these men may find my joy completed in themselves. Not only is it fulfilled, but it's completed in them. Now, the obvious question is, we have to believe all, or the obvious thing that we have to make a statement here is we have to believe this is true. You cannot be activated by how you feel. Uh, I, I, I remember one time whenever I was pastoring the first church that I ever pastored and, and I woke up and I was in the shower. I can see myself right now. And I lived in a trailer. Don't ever say you won't do anything. I said, I'll never live in a trailer. First church I went to pastor, they, their parsonage was a trailer. Here I'm, I'm laying up against the side of the shower and the devil saying, this is going to be the worst day you've ever had in your life. So it ain't going to be hardly anybody that's been there. You ever had those days as the pastor? Yeah, there's nobody going to show up, you know, and it's just going to be terrible. We didn't have any special promotions going on. We didn't have anything of that nature. I mean, people came from everywhere. And the joy of the Lord filled the house of God that day. All I'm saying by that is, you see, the devil tries to talk to you and to me and to get us off course uh, of believing that God said he is going to be with you. You know, one of the things I think about as we were worshiping and praising the Lord here this morning, I said, Pastor and the staff, you guys have done a great job. This church is just phenomenal. What you and I are experiencing here today, you don't find in a lot of churches. I'm, I'm going to be very honest with you. You don't find that. You have an openness to come and to worship and to praise and to glorify God. And when you do that, when you worship Him, then the glory of God comes down. The more that you worship Him, the more of the glory of God comes down. You want to have the presence of God living in the body, you just keep worshiping Him and thanking Him and praising Him. I'm going to tell you, you're going to get the activation of the Holy Ghost moving inside of your life. You're going to live in a continual camp meeting because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, I know I don't need to get excited, but I like to do that every now and then. So we have to believe that these things are true because faith is the thing that not only unlocks the door to continuous joy, but as you and I well know, it unlocks the door to all of the other things that you and I will experience. You never experienced salvation until you believed that Jesus died for your sins and he hung upon the cross and took your sins, my sins, the sins of the world, Upon him, if we don't believe that, then we're not saved. But when we believe that, he said, you went from death into life. That means I have eternal life right now. Hallelujah. That's something to get excited about. 
So then when we can see that there's a, a lot of different places that give us the uh, examples of that. Mark chapter 9 and verse 23 tells us this. He said, when Jesus was talk, talking to a man who had a son that had an evil spirit, which had made him mute, made him fall to the ground and foam at the mouth, he would also make him grind his teeth and stiffen his body. Jesus said to the man, meaning to the father, if you can believe, all things are possible to him to believe. What he was basically saying, you see your son like this, if you believe in me, he can be delivered from this state. He can be made whole. And this is the occasion whenever he said, Lord, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. Meaning there was a certain measure, a certain part there that was not believing. And so we can see that whenever that, uh, uh, he, he said this to the man and he was trying to tell him, I want you to know that I am here and I can minister to this need. If you can believe, and he's saying this to you and I today, if we can believe, all things are possible as well. We can see great miracles and live in his continual joy. We can live in his continual joy. And, and you have to understand, it, it's not by your feelings. Uh, we are a very touchy-feely kind of a people, but what we do sometimes is we let that feeling dictate whether or not we're really in the joy of the Lord or not. I give you honest uh, a confession here this morning. Uh, I was standing over there and God said, run. I said, Lord, I'm just doing good. <laughs> and he kept saying, run. And, and I said, well, I'm not really feeling this, Lord. He said, I said, run. And so I started running. Well, it was while I was running that I started feeling it. Obedience is better, is it not? And you see that whenever, I, I, if, I, if I could take a poll, if I had the time to take the poll here this morning and to say all of the people in this building, when you saw the different individuals coming to the altars and people pray for one another, did it bless you? Did it build your spirits up? If you, if you were honest, you'd say, yes, I, my heart was overjoyed as I was seeing God work through his people. You see, it's not you, it's not me, it's him working in us that makes the difference. I don't have any power within myself, but I got all of the power in him, hallelujah, just like every person in this building here today. Praise God. Yes, give him a praise offering. You see, Jesus did not just come just so that we would have eternal life and then we just kind of get along through the rest of the life. Well, praise God, I made it through today. <laughs> Whenever I read John 10 and 10, he says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. That word abundantly in the Greek means superabundance. It means excessive. It means overflowing. It means surplus. It means over and above. It means more than enough. It means profuse. It means extraordinary. It means above the ordinary. That's who you are. You are out of the ordinary because the God of all gods lives inside of you today. Man, can somebody say praise the Lord in this place today? Amen. Whenever God said he gave the children of Israel the promised land, what did he say about that? He said it's a land that's what? Filled with milk and honey. Now, <clears throat> they say that they, they sent the spies in to kind of look and to see what kind of land that it was they were going into. And they said the fruit was so large, the pomegranates and the grapes, it says that they had to have two men with a pole in between them to carry the clusters because they were so big. And whenever that they saw the land, they said, yes, it is a land filled with milk and honey, but there are giants in the land. Whenever you put the word but in, you're going to have problems. If God said it, it is. And I'm here to stand flat-footed and to tell you in the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if you are a believer in Him, you have the fullness of joy in you. You have the fullness of His joy in you right now. 
but I can hear it right now, but I don't feel it. I didn't say you had to feel it. I said you got it. But you got to know how to activate it. Now I'm coming to the main part of my sermon. How do you activate the joy of the Lord that's within you? Okay, Luke chapter 6 and verse 22 and verse 23 is a good place for us to start. Are you with me? Amen. Wave at me in the back if you're with me. Okay, good deal. Amen. I got two lovely people that I pastored in uh, Harlan Road Church of God, uh, Ethan and Miranda. They're just great people. They're here with us today. Praise God. But in Luke chapter 6 and verse 22, this is what the word of the Lord says. Blessed, and as our brother said here this morning, uh, Brother Cameron, blessed means happy. Okay? Blessed or happy are you when men hate you. Doesn't that make you just feel great? I'm happy. I found out the best friend that I ever had just hates me. But he says, I, I looked this all up in the Greek. I like to know exactly what these words say and also in other dictionaries. And it means hate, hate you. It means unable to stand you. I can't stand to be around that person. I just hate them. I don't like them. He said, and when they exclude you, mean they just shut you off. Remember one time I preached to you and I said, you know, they just kind of give you the hand. You know, I don't want to mess with you. I don't want to talk to you. And revile you. They slander you. They say all kinds of things. And they cast you, your name out as evil. Literally, they kick you out. He says, for the Son of Man's sake. He says, when that day comes, you ready? We're talking about activating the joy that's in you. When that happens, this is what I want you to do. He said, rejoice. And then he says, I want you to leap for joy. Praise God, they hate me. <laughs> and I know that sounds foolish. It looks foolish, doesn't it? But we're talking about doing things the way God says to do it. And when we put it into practice, we activate the joy that's inside of us. Then he says, one doesn't naturally feel, or this is comments that I made, one doesn't naturally feel like rejoicing or leaping for joy when these things happen to us. But nonetheless, this is what the Lord commands us to do. And when we do them, we activate the joy that is within us. Can you think of anybody? And you know, I used to think about this when I was pastoring. And I said, you know, I'm a pretty nice guy, I think. But you know, I come to find out there were some people who just didn't like me. And I couldn't understand that for the, for the life of me. I mean, my wife, you know, she thinks I'm a pretty nice person. Most of the time. <laughs> I don't want to lie there, Brother Gene. <laughs> okay. But anyway, whenever that we, we do these things, we activate. And then this one, I, when I read this, and I've studied the scriptures for years, but I don't ever think I saw it just like this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9 and 10, uh, this is whenever, you know, Paul prayed three times, Lord, remove the, the thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, uh, this one. He says, and he, and he, the Lord, said to me, whenever he prayed and asked, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, I know that grace means unmerited favor. And, and, and I know that it means undeserved favor and undeserved blessing. It's a free gift. I understand that. But did you know that Greek word is the word charos? And the word charos is the word that we have for joy. That's what the actual rendering of it. He says basically the word chara is joy and chero is to rejoice. One is joy and the other is to rejoice. To rejoice. And he says my grace, my joy... My rejoicing is sufficient for you. And he says, for my strength is made perfect or complete in your weakness. Now, I don't know about you. I never like to be weak. Brad, if you can believe this, I used to go to the gym six days a week. But I don't look that way now. <laughs> 
And, and I would exercise and I would do everything that I would need to do because I just don't like to be weak. I don't like to, and I don't like to be weak mentally. I don't, I don't like to be weak emotionally. I just don't like to be weak. But God says, in your weakness. And I can remember times that whenever I was going through the, some of the greatest struggles of my life as a pastor, I did some of the greatest preaching I've ever done in my life. Whenever I was underneath that heavy load, it had to be God or nothing else. It was not anything because everybody liked me and thought I was the greatest thing since popcorn. But nonetheless, you know, it was a thing to where that I have to understand that God allows us to go through things. Sister Teresa, I have to tell you, I was thinking about you when I preached this message in Heron, and I thought about the things that you went through with. And I know that through this journey, you've learned more about your Savior than you've ever learned before, I imagine, if the time would permit for you to tell that. There's a, there's a closeness and there's an intimacy that we get with God whenever we go through those times of weakness. And none of us that are here like to be weak. You know, I always in high school, I wanted to be the cool dude. I wanted all the girls to like Ted Ed. I know I don't look like it now, but I used to be pretty good looking. But none of them. All right. Honey, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> All right. And it says here, whenever he says, uh, in this word, he says, therefore, Paul said, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities. Boast in my infirmities. The word infirmities not only means weakness. Listen to this. It means diseases. It means sicknesses. It means afflictions. And Paul said, I'm going to boast in these things. And here's why he said I'm going to do that. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. In my boasting, the power of God is activated in my life. Now, my mother had cancer three different times, and God healed her uh, every time as far as I can remember. But the journey that she went through with was the most important thing about the whole issue. I used to listen to uh, uh, Bear Bryant. He used to be the football coach for the uh, Alabama Crimson Tide. And he would say, he said that it's that journey that makes these players what they are. It's, it's them getting in there and participating and being a part and going through the struggles and the difficulties that helps to make them what they are. Now, he says, Therefore, I take pleasure also in infirmities, in reproaches. Meaning, I take, I take uh, pleasure in people disapproving of me and people being disappointed with me. I take, I take uh, pleasure in being in needs, in persecutions, meaning living with hostility and ill treatment. In distresses, meaning in anxiety, in sorrow, or pain, for Christ's sake. He says, for when I'm, I am weak, then I am strong. Amen. Now, <clears throat> we're getting ready to come to the close of this thing here in a minute. And uh, I'm going to give you some scriptures, and I'm going to give you some actual testimonies of some situations that people have been involved with. In Philippians chapter 4 and 4, this is what the word of the Lord says. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. My wife loves to sing that little song, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice. And again, I say, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18 says this. Rejoice always. That means all the time, doesn't it? 
Now, sure, you don't, you know, you're not standing up and making a speech, you know, and it's supposed to be something that's in for. Well, I'm just go, I'm just praising God for all the same information here today. But nonetheless, you understand what I'm saying about rejoicing always. And he says, pray without ceasing. And then in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Ephesians 5 and 20 says, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The scriptures tell us in Psalms 30 and verse 5, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. You saw the song that we were singing and the words about Jesus that how that the earth mourned and how that the sun didn't shine and how that there was this great sadness. But whenever the shaking of the earthquake took place and our Lord came forth victoriously out of that grave. I'm telling you that you and I, we go through things in this life and God wants to bring great victory in our lives. He says uh, also... I'm saying also we need to activate our joy then by giving thanks in th- all things and for all things. And then other, another scripture that I've always thought was so important, and this was my grandmother's favorite scripture in all of the Bible, Romans 8 and 28. For we know that all things work together for good to those who love him and to those who are called according to his purpose. You might not understand it now, but everything that's happening in your life, God, some way or another, is in the midst of it. Because God's purpose for you and for me, number one, is that we would glorify Him. You are His child. Every person on the face of this earth is His child. I never have known a bad parent that didn't love their child. And how that he is continually thinking of ways to getting you and me into fellowship with him. Into deeper fellowship with him. And so that he allows these things to happen in our lives. And I'm going to close with this. I don't know if anybody's ever read the book. It's called Prison to Praise. Anybody read that book before by Merlin Carruthers? And this is what, these are some of the things that he said. He said that God asked him one day, says, Merlin... Are you uh, glad that my son died for you? He said, well, yeah, I'm really glad. He says, does it make you really happy to know that my son died for you? Well, yes, Lord, it does. And and Merlin was almost kind of making, getting feel whether or not he was answering correctly or not. But then whenever that he began to talk to him more, he said, Merlin, I don't ever want you to complain another day in your life. And he says, here's the reason why. If the things that you're going through with can be equal to what my son went through through with, he said, then maybe you got a reason to complain. But if not, you don't have any reason to grumble and complain. Scripture in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 10 tells us this. It pleased the father to bruise his son. And that word in the Hebrew there, bruise, means to crush. I don't know of any father that wants to do any kind of harm to their son. But it brings into focus even more so. Whenever John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son and that whosoever will believe upon him they shall not die they shall not perish but they shall have everlasting life a father that loves you and me so much that it made him happy to bruise his son because he knew what the outcome was going to take place. There's many testimonies I could share with you, but there's one in particular, the, uh, a man by the name of Ron and Sue. It's a true story. Back in the 1960s during the Vietnam War, Ron was a lawyer, and he joined the Army, 
and he didn't want to join as an officer. He wanted to be as an enlisted man for whatever reason. <clears throat> so he did that. His wife, Sue, she had some real abandonment issues. Whenever she was born, her mom and dad gave her away. She was adopted, and then for whatever reason, later on, the adopted parents disowned her. So she felt this abandonment. You know, there's something wrong with me. People don't like me, and here's the caregivers of my life. They're giving me away. And so whenever they got the news that Ron was going to be uh, on duty in Vietnam, Sue fell apart. And she even threatened to commit suicide. And so Ron and Sue were very distraught. So they went to the chaplain. They went to see Chaplain Carruthers. And God had been dealing with him all along with this about giving thanks and everything and giving praise to the Lord for everything. So when they came and they visited with the past, uh, with the chaplain, he said, I've got just the answer for you. And they said, what is it? He says, I want you to get on your knees. And he says, I want you to thank God that, Ron, you're going to Vietnam. They couldn't believe what they were hearing. And then he said, I want you to thank God that your wife is even threatening to commit suicide. And they were believers. And they just, they got so upset, they left. They, they were not going to listen to that kind of counsel. So they finally, they came back after a few days because uh, they were wanting the chaplain to try to write for new orders so that he wouldn't have to go to Vietnam. And he said, I don't feel to do that other than just to do what I'm telling you. And so what happened was, is one day they were coming out of a chapel service, or they were coming out of the chapel, they'd been there praying, and Ron ran into one of his college buddies who was in the law uh, for the military. And he said, Ron, he says, what are you doing? He said, well, I've got orders, I'm going to Vietnam. He said, listen, I really need you where I'm at. He said, would you mind putting in for a transfer? And he said, well, yeah, I guess I could. And so he began the paperwork to get us transfer. Well, the wife, she had been in the chapel service and she went to go to see the chaplain. So she was sitting in the waiting room there and there was a young man that walked in and uh, she could tell he was distraught because of the uh, expression on his face. And she said, uh, are, are you okay? He said, no, I'm not. He said, my wife wants a divorce. And she said, well, you don't want to go talk to that, path, that chaplain because she knew what he was going to tell him. And so, sure enough, you know, he said, I want you to thank God that your wife is wanting to a divorce. Here's the reason why. Believing, according to Romans 8 and 28, that all things are working together for good. Not that he wanted a divorce. Don't misunderstand me. But believing that somehow or another that God was working in the midst of all of the circumstances. Well, to, to bring this even closer to uh, close here, uh, the young man started showing the girl pictures of his family and he flipped over a picture and there was a picture of a woman and the girl screamed she said who is that he said well that's my mother she said no that's my mother she said, my adoptive parents showed me the papers and up in the top right hand corner there was a picture of my biological mother I don't know they must have done it at that time. I don't know why, but nonetheless, this is, this is how the story went. Not only did she reconnect with her brother, but with her entire biological family, she was reunited. When she began to thank God and to praise God, believing that he was involved in all of the circumstances that was taking place in their life at that time. A real quick one, there was a woman that had a daughter that was a striptease dancer. She saw the chaplain asking, what can I do? I've prayed, I've fasted, I've sought the Lord, I've done everything that I know to do. He says, I want you to thank God that your daughter is a stripteaser. She said, what? 
but she had tried everything else and she did it half-heartedly one day a young man was walking by the club that she was playing in Holy Spirit spoke to him and said I want you to go in and said you see that girl right there he said I want you to tell her that I love her young man he walked into the club she was evidently in the middle of a routine and he said I've come here to tell you God loves you he went back and sat down at the table and after her routine was over he came back and sat at the table and she said why did you do that he said God just spoke to me and told me to tell you from that point on that girl came to know Jesus as a personal savior I'm going to tell you the reason why. I've tried to think about this. Why would God tell us to do some things that seem so abnormal? Do you know the pressure that you and I have? I'll just use it for this. I know the pressure that I have of I've got loved ones and they're not saved. Oh, are they, are they going to make it in? Or, you know, oh goodness, I'm, I'm so... Do we believe when we pray and we ask God to touch in the lives of those young, those family members that God is doing it. Our actions sometimes seems to say differently because we're in such worry and we're in such stress. And did you know that kind of emotion transfers to people that you talk to? It's 12 o'clock. I'm going to have to close this out. My challenge to you this morning is this. I want you to think about maybe the most horrible thing that you're going through with right now. Teresa, I thought about you whenever I had to preach this message. I said, you know you're going to be preaching, Teresa. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying. For me challenging you to say, God, I thank you for my cancer. But somehow or another, Lord, I'm believing that you're working that in my life, bringing me to the place that I need to be with you. I had a dad that I, I preached to you the last time I was had an opportunity. My dad and I never had a good relationship. It was awful. It was terrible. But you know, I thank God that he and I didn't have a good relationship for this reason. Fred and I, you and I talked about this the other night when I talked about my dad. I understand how other people that, do, that had the same kind of relationship how they feel. I understand that rejection. I understand longing for your dad to be a good dad. And I never had it. Never. But I rejoice in the fact of what I'm able to do because of my life and what went, went on in my life. Now, I know sometimes it's hard. I know some people, they've got such hatred in their hearts for certain people right now. I've talked to them. I know what I've got to do, but I can't do it right now. The hatred that I have inside of me is so strong and so bitter. I just don't think I can do that. Can you see the power that there is if I can start thanking God? I thank you, God, that I've got this bitterness in my heart because I know that I can't get it out, but I know that you helping me, I can. There's one thing I learned fresh and anew this morning when I came here today. You can ask my wife. I, I get nervous whenever I'm going to be preaching and there's some nights on a Saturday night I don't, I don't even go to bed. I stay up all night. But it's kind of like, you know, last night I, I was trying to get some time. I went to bed a little late, but not as late as I normally get to. But this morning it was just kind of like the Lord spoke to me and said, Ted, everything's going to be okay. And again, again, as many years as I've been preaching, somehow or another I feel like it's dependent upon me. And it's not dependent upon me. It's dependent upon Him. And you see, that's where you and I, that we go through these struggles in life and we feel like, oh, I've messed up. You know, I can't live this thing. I can't do it. Thank God you messed up because you can say, Lord, I know that you're going to help me because I'm giving my life to you. I'm going to get back up 
It says a righteous man will fall seven times, but he'll always get back up and keep on going. Let's stand. <clears throat> now, I want you to do this with every... You might say, <clears throat> well, I can't do this thing sincerely. Well, I want you to do it sincerely, but if I can get you or the Lord can get you to even saying it with your mouth, confessing it with your mouth, there's something that starts touching on the inside here as well. Because I believe that's the desire of your heart. Lord, I thank you that Dad was like he was. Lord, I thank you for other things that I've went through with in my life. I would not wish them on anybody in the world, but I thank you because I believe that you're taking all of those things and working them together for my good. Are you ready? Just right out of your own heart, whatever you would want to say to the Lord. And I want you to keep saying it for the rest of this day as much as you can remember. Lord, I thank you for this situation. I thank you for this illness. I thank you for this disease. I thank you for this infirmity. I thank you that that person doesn't like me. I thank you, God, that people yell at me sometimes and I don't even know why. I thank you because somehow or another I know that you're working in my life and helping me to experience the fullness of your joy in my life. Let's do it. Father, thank you. We glorify you. We magnify you. We lift up your name today. You're worthy. You're worthy, dear Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be to your name. Blessed.